Thank you, David. And thank Paul. Can you hear him back? That's what I thought I'd listen. Oh, it's not listening. Oh. It's taped and numbered. Oh. Thank Paul and everybody else for making this the best conference of its sort I've been to in many years. It's been great fun. And the privilege of working on, on William James is, is wonderful and has been sharpened for me by this conference in which are you talking about psychology or philosophy or something else? It reminds me of the time I went into the health center at Wesleyan when I was teaching there. And somebody put a piece of paper on the bulletin board saying a few things I wish I'd known before I got to college. Don't mind me. I'm yep. Just... Okay. That going to be better? Yes. Back? Okay. A few things I wish I'd known before I got to college. And there was a little list typed underneath that. And it went that psychology is really biology, that biology is really chemistry, that chemistry is really physics, and that physics is really math. And I thought, yeah, I wish I'd known all of that stuff then too. I was teaching at Wesley in, in the 1990s and trying to get up the nerve to undertake a biography of William James, when there were already many excellent ones in existence. I happened one day to cross the path of a colleague named Hope Weissman, who stopped me like Coleridge's ancient mariner to tell me her William James story. Hope was a highly regarded teacher, and she had an inherited condition. I think it was MS, I'm not sure. But it was a wasting disease that meant that she would, like her mother before her, die early. And what she wanted to tell me, what she wanted me to really understand, was how much it had meant to her to find William James writing about how we all eventually have to face up to the difficult, the deeply unfair side of life, that the hardest question we ever have to answer is, speaking of some unrelenting problem or fresh disaster, some utterly unwelcome reality, is will you or won't you have it so? The hero, as James knew and as Hope knew too, is the person who can stand it, can stand the world, can accept reality, even an ugly and unwanted reality. It was an insight that Hope Weissman told me that she clung to and tried to live by. The passage that she had in mind, this is such a daunting crowd. Everybody out there knows more about some piece of James than I do. But it's also been a, a warm crowd. The passage, which you all know, that she had in mind comes toward the end of a 95 page long chapter on the will in the principles which James published in 1890 in two volumes running 1280 pages. James had worked on the book for 12 years and the chapter toils along noting that willed actions or voluntary movements must be secondary not primary functions of our organism. Primary functions for James are our reflex actions, actions we take without thinking, without willing. James is interested in exactly how the will works at the most basic neurological and physiological level. He gives many examples of laboratory tests and experiments with diagrams of nerve pathways, currents, contractions, discharges, excitations and drainages at the cellular level. He's quick to admit, and this is 1890, that new laboratory work is challenging and bringing his, out his findings, changing his findings even as his own work is going to press. The point is not that James fully understood the physiology of the brain in willing, but that he was looking for answers at that level, the cellular level. Not for him the metaphysics of the will, 
What he wanted was the physical basis of the process of willing. A modern reader should not then be put off or put to sleep by the scientific detail, but encouraged and reassured to find James plugging away at the neurological basis of the phenomenon we call will. But James was not willing to leave the subject at the cellular level. He returns magnificently toward the end of the chapter with a consideration of voluntary, that is to say, willed effort. We measure ourselves by many standards, he wrote. Our strength and our intelligence, our wealth, even our good luck are things that warm our heart and make us feel ourselves a match for life. But deeper than all such things, and able to suffice unto itself without them, is the sense of the amount of effort which we can put forth. He who can make none is but a shadow, he who can make much is a hero. The huge world puts all sorts of questions to us and tests us in all sorts of ways. Some of the tests we meet by actions that are easy and some of the questions we answer in articulately formulated words. But the deepest question that is ever asked admits of no reply but the dumb turning of the will and the tightening of our heartstrings as we say, yes, I will even have it so. Now, most of the principles is not written in this direct and appealing style, but in a professorial style, intended primarily to reach other psychology professionals in, or serious apprentice students. James' long chapter on will does, as we've seen, rise on occasion to an almost prophetic level. But one is far more likely to find oneself working to grasp such a sentence as this. The connate paths of least resistance are the paths of instinctive reaction, and I submit as my first hypothesis that these paths all run one way, that is from sensory cells into motor cells, and from motor cells into muscles without ever taking the reverse direction. What had taken James 12 years to write took him just six weeks to revise into Psychology Briefer Course, which came out in 1892. James cut the text by two-thirds, from 1,280 pages to 400. He now made the chapter on Will the final and climactic chapter of the book, and he cut away the vast majority of the physiological detail. So psychology briefer course represents James' second style, a style he used mostly when addressing college philosophy clubs or other groups of educated grown-ups. With the physiological details stripped out, psychology briefer course now ended with the great peroration on the will, the first part of which I've already quoted, and it goes on. The world thus finds in the heroic person its worthy match and mate, and the effort which he is able to put forth to hold himself erect and keep his heart unshaken is the direct measure of his worth and function in the game of life. He can stand this universe. He can meet it and keep up his faith in it in the presence of those same features which lay his weaker brethren low. And hereby, he makes himself one of the masters and the lords of life. Hear the little Emersonian echo in that. He must be counted with henceforth. He forms a part of human destiny. Neither in the theoretic nor in the practical sphere do we care for or go for help to those who have no head for risk. No sense of living on the perilous edge. After pointing out that our faith is apt to be a faith in someone else's faith, he concludes, thus not only our morality but our religion, so far as the latter is deliberate, depend on the effort we can make. Will you or won't you have it so? Is the most probing question we are ever asked, and we're asked it every hour of the day. And about the largest as well as the smallest, the most theoretical as well as the most physical things. And we answer, he says, by consents or non-consents, not by words. What wonder 
that these dumb responses should seem our deepest organs of communication with the nature of things. What wonder if the effort demanded by them be the measure of our worth as men and women? What wonder if the amount which we accord of it were the one strictly underived and original contribution we make to the world? Exclamation point. In 1892, just as briefer chorus was coming out, James gave a series of talks to the public school teachers of Cambridge. And after repeating the talks to various teacher audiences, James pulled the talks together as a volume in 1899, and it was called Talks to Teachers and to Students on Some of Life's Ideals. If the principles of psychology became known to generations of students as James, and a briefer course was called Jimmy, so Talks to Teachers, James' third pass on the subject, has to be called just Jim. In this new book, the 400-page briefer course was condensed to a mere 100 pages for the entire book. That's the length of the chapter on will and the principles. And for this volume, James adopted a style appropriate to a general audience of teachers of all grades. In effect, a third style, which is in many ways his most accessible. Again, will is the culminating chapter handled now in 13 and a half pages. And while he had declared in a briefer course we can ignore the free will question in psychology, he now felt somewhat differently. After considering the part played by voluntary attention in volition, he concluded that a belief in free will is still open to us. We are free, he says elsewhere, to live as if we were free. As if. It's Touchstone's line in As You Like It. Much virtue in if, he says. If free will were true, it would be absurd, says James, to have the belief in it fatally forced on our acceptance. Isaac Bashevis Singer made the same point when in the course of an interview that was published in Salon, he was asked if he believed in free will. Of course, I believe in free will, he answered. Do I have a choice? <laughs> there was nothing arbitrary about putting the chapter on will last. Since mentality terminated naturally in outward conduct, the final chapter in psychology, he said, has to be the chapter on the will. And now he's ready to define acts of will in a narrow sense as such acts only as cannot be inattentively performed. And now he closes grandly again with the distinction between actions taken to avoid something and actions taken to achieve something. And here's the last paragraph of the little book. Spinoza long ago wrote in his ethics that anything that a man can avoid under the notion that it is bad, he may also avoid under the notion that something else is good. And he who hab habitually acts sub specie mali under the aspect of evil, under the negative notion, the notion of the bad is called a slave by Spinoza. To him who acts habitually under the notion of good, he gives the name of freeman, free man. See to it now, I beg you. And I love that urgency. You can just see the man leaning out. See to it now, I beg you, that you make free men of your pupils by habituating them to act whenever possible under the notion of a good. Get them habitually to tell the truth, not so much through showing the wickedness of lying as by arousing their enthusiasm for honor and veracity. Wean them from their native cruelty by imparting to them some of your own positive sympathy with the mind's inner springs of joy. And in the lessons which you may be legally obliged to conduct upon the bad effects of alcohol, this was legislated, lay less stress than the books do on the drunkard's stomach, kidneys, nerves, and social miseries, and more on the blessings of having an organism kept in lifelong possession of its full youthful elasticity by a sweet, sound blood to which stimulants and narcotics are unknown and to which the morning sun and air and dew will daily come as sufficiently powerful intoxicants. 
Reminded a little of Emily Dickinson in there too, inebriative air, am I. James's third style was his most popular. It was earnest, hopeful, and above all practical, and he used it more and more as he grew older. But he could write in any one of the three styles at any time. Elements of the third style can be found in the principles, while some of James's late writing on radical empiricism is as difficult and professionally aimed as any of his earlier work. And while there are great advantages to the achieved simplicity and directness of the third style, at least in the matter of the will that is before us, there are losses as well as gains in the third style of talks to teachers. And for just a glimpse and a closing glimpse at that of James's astonishing mental power, his enormous play of mind and his genius for seeing connections, I want to go back to the principles. For this is where James drops a couple of his last and to my mind, his most astonishing remarks about the will. And these remarks occur not in the long chapter on the will, but in the chapter called The Perception of Reality, which was, as we were saying yesterday, a reworked piece that he had published as an article called The Psychology of Belief. Now, it's just like psychology of belief when it's in a professional journal. When you say what you really mean, he's talking about the perception of the real. The two titles mean the same thing. So we should not perhaps be surprised when he tells us as he works to conclude the chapter and using italics for emphasis, will and belief in short, meaning the certain relation between objects and the self are two names for one and the same psychological phenomenon. Will is belief and the other way around. And in a footnote, a footnote James drops his last best observation, a connection bright enough to rewrite much of philosophy and religion by the most compendious possible formula, he says, says the footnote, would be that our belief and attention are the same fact. For the moment, what we attend to is reality. Attention is a motor reaction and we are so made that sensations force attention from us. Belief and attention are the same fact. That is some challenge. What? Our beloved beliefs fought and died for are to be brought down to the level of mere animal attention? No. That is what James following Spinoza would call the negative view. What the equation of attention and belief really means is that the apparently trivial or even mechanical matter of attention, fixed attention, fully paid attention, attention armed and active and all-seeing is not a trivial matter at all, but a matter of enormous power and urgency and importance in our lives and worthy to be raised up to the same honorific level as, quote, belief. And once one has seen the connection between attention and belief, the next question, I think, is the one we started with. Will you or won't you have it so? Thanks.